Hello. Hello, hello. Um, thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, whoever's got that. Um, the uh, looking around this crowd, I think it's pretty clear that uh, most of you remember when CCNY on Convent Avenue actually stood for a Catholic convent, now Yiddish. Uh, um, so um, Jews, we are in the Center for Jewish History. Jews are known, of course, as the people of the book. But we're going to focus tonight on those who were the people of the bookie. Um, <laughs> And um, with Matthew uh, Goodman. Um, but before we start, I've just out of curiosity, can I ask for a show of hands, how many of you here have ever placed a bet on a horse race, a card game, a sporting event, ever? All right. I just want to establish that we're a room full of sinners. Uh, and, and we can move from there. Matthew, uh, the... the um, I think most folks here probably know the outlines of the 1949-50 team and then the scandal that followed, but can you take us through it? Um, how did the wheels come off uh, that wonderful wagon? Um, and perhaps, because not everybody would know, um, what point shaving involved? It's not the same as throwing a game, obviously, but why is it bad? Uh, thank you. Um... I want to start first by thanking you all for coming and thank Judy, thank you Judy for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, it is delightful to be uh, speaking in front of a crowd to whom I don't have to uh, explain what Nedix uh, is, uh, or uh, many of whom know who, who uh, the uh, Raymond the Bagel Man was. Thank you. That's the easiest laugh I'll get tonight. Um, and who know what Alagaru refers to. Um, I, was doing, uh, I was doing an event recently in Houston where they knew none of these things. Um, and before the event- They didn't even know how to pronounce the name of their city. That's right. <laughs> I was in Houston, I was in Houston. And, uh, and the promoter said to me beforehand, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid that we're not gonna have a very good crowd tonight. And I said, why? And she said, well, it's 52 degrees out. And the Houstonians don't come out when it's 52 degrees. So anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. So uh, we're talking about the 1949-50 City College Beavers basketball team, which is the only team in history to this day, the only uh, team in history to win both of the college uh, postseason tournaments in the same year, the NIT and the NCAA. Uh, they, it was a remarkable achievement, and they were a remarkable team, uh, not just for their achievement, but in large part because of the composition of this team. Uh, you know, this is just two years after Jackie Robinson had integrated Major League Baseball, and it's a time when the newly formed National Basketball Association had not a single black player in it. Uh, the NBA had not yet integrated. Uh, well, at that moment, the City College Beavers consisted entirely of what at the time were called minority players. It was 11 Jewish players and four African-American players. Uh, nobody had ever seen a team quite like that before. Um, and they were beloved when they achieved this success. They were beloved by New York. Um, and we can talk more about that later, but you know, they seem to represent so much of what New York wanted to think about itself. You know, they represented racial harmony and civic virtue and so forth. Um, and they were uh, heroes. And then a year later, this is to, you know, put a, a, a bow on the, the question. Uh, a year later, they were coming back from a game in Philadelphia uh, against Temple, and they were met at the old Penn Station by four New York City detectives, and uh, four members of the team were arrested and uh, charged with conspiring with gamblers to shape points. Uh, they were brought downtown, where they confessed under severe interrogation by the cops, and went literally overnight from heroes to villains, uh, literally overnight, because by the next morning it was all in the, you know, on the radio. Um, 
what was point shaving? Point shaving was the idea that a gambler would give a player money not to lose a game, but simply to come in under the point spread. The point spread was the number of points that a consortium of bookmakers thought that a team should win by. So if City was favored to win by nine, they could win by eight or seven or six. They wouldn't have to lose the game. They could just come in under the points. But, and, and that's what they did. But did, did point shaving, which sounds on one level relatively innocent, lead to lost games? Things can get out of hand, I would assume. Well, yes. I mean, you know, in the case of Sandy College, uh, there were three games in the subsequent, the, the post, the following season after the championship. They shaved points in three games. And they lost all three of those games, not intentionally, but as it turned out, City was really bad at point shaving. And you know what happened was that you know LIU across town in Brooklyn was very good at point shaving, and they managed. You know, even when the spread was like four points, they managed to win by two, you know, or three. They were very good at what was called controlling the points. But City was very bad at controlling the points, and they lost every single game because, as it turned out. Uh, they kind of, um, psychologically, it wasn't very good for them. And their whole game was based on teamwork and trust and confidence in each other. And once certain members of the team were shaving, that kind of ruined that finely that finally, uh, tuned sense. And, and they, they, they lost all their games. I should mention, by the way, that this is the team that we're talking about, the championship team. Uh, Nat Holman, is the legendary Nat Holman was the coach, uh, and that's them with their two tournament trophies. Um, you mentioned LIU. Um, other schools clearly were caught up in the investigations and scandals. Can, how widespread was it? And was it largely an East Coast phenomenon or even a New York area phenomenon, or did it, um, did it extend elsewhere in the country? Well, it's interesting. Um, ultimately, seven members of the City College team were arrested and confessed. Uh, ultimately, 14 players from New York, the New York area, were involved in this from four schools. Uh, but ultimately, it moved beyond New York, uh, elsewhere around the country. The top two teams in the country in those days was Bradley from Peoria, Illinois. Uh, and they, as it turned out, were involved. And Kentucky, the University of Kentucky, which was the number two ranked team in the country, and it turned out they were involved as well. Their coach was a guy by the name of Adolph Rupp. Uh, we can talk, we'll talk more about Kentucky later. But Adolph Rupp famously said when the City College guys got arrested, um, the gamblers couldn't touch my boys with a 10 foot pole. And then, like three weeks later. So they used an 11 foot that's, pole. That's the joke, yes. <laughs> That's what they said, the gamblers found an 11 foot pole because they, three of his guys got arrested as well. So it was an East Coast thing, but then eventually it became uh, a national scandal. Uh, there were five great basketball programs in New York in those days, City College, Long Island University, Manhattan College, NYU, and St. John's. And interestingly enough, four of those schools were involved, and the one that was not involved was St. John's University. Uh, and as I discuss in my book, I think there's very good reason to believe, very good reason to believe that St. John's was involved as well um, and was protected by a police administration that was overwhelmingly Irish Catholic and very supportive of St. John's. Wonder how that works. Um, the, um... It, it's, it, you know, it's no coincidence, by the way, that the, uh, the, the police commissioner at that time, William Patrick O'Brien, was best friends with the coach of right. St. John's. Yeah, probably uh, not at all. Um, but there have been college scandals of more recent vintage, which I guess kind of astounds me at some level. Um, actually, can I back up for with a very personal story just very briefly? Uh, I probably shouldn't have been this naive in 1970 when the Knicks were at their greatest uh, point, which certainly they're not now. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And um, I, I had just come out of the Army, and I had missed a good chunk of the development of this team. Anyway, I was invited by a colleague at the New York Post who, who had uh, season's tickets, and we were at the game, and the Knicks were up by two with a couple of seconds left, and the other team, I, I don't remember which it was, 
scored a basket at the buzzer and tied up the game uh, to send it into overtime. And the entire Madison Square Garden was cheering, and I was totally flummoxed by this. Was, what is going on? And he looked at me like I was a village idiot, which I guess I was, because um, the Knicks, I learned, were not about to cover the point spread that the gamblers had signed. So that overtime gave them another chance uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, so even if they'd won by two points, it would have been a loss for anybody who bet them. Um, I guess a lot of us were innocent in this regard. And, and so it, it comes as a shock to repeated scandals of this sort. Have, have they faded or do we keep having them recur? Well, you know, in, 1950, in 1951, 33 guys were arrested and were, by the way, banned for life from, from basketball, from the NBA, uh, from the blacklisted, essentially. Uh, two of them, well, three of them went to prison. Uh, they were the first college athletes ever to go to prison for, college, uh, for gambling-related uh, offenses. Uh, even the Black Sox of 1919, who were trying to lose games, did not go to prison. Uh, but uh, the two best of the college players who was Ed Warner of City College and Sherman White of Long Island University went to prison, uh, spent time in Rikers Island. Uh, they would surely have become stars in the NBA, but they were both African Americans. And the judge uh, made clear his distaste for these particular uh, individuals. Uh, but, you know, people said, well, you know, we got it, we've rooted it out. Uh, we've gotten rid of point shaving, and then 10 years later there was another scandal in 61, and then there was another one in the 70s, and another one in the 80s, and another one in the 90s. So we can talk more about this later, but all of the conditions that existed in 1951 that, that, that led to uh, the point shaving scandal are far worse today than they were, than they were back then. Uh, like what, for example? Well, the amount of the the amount of money that's flowing through the game. You know, the the head coach. Let me just say this: the head coach of City was a guy named Nat Holman, uh, a legendary guy. Uh, he was. I'll just talk about Nat Holman for a little while. Uh, Nat Holman. His real name was Nathan Helmanovich, by the way. Uh, he was from the Lower East Side. He learned to play basketball at the Henry Street Settlement House. Um, he was considered the greatest basketball player of his time. He was the, the highest paid basketball player of his time. He was the star player for the original Celtics, the touring team. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, I discovered in my research that in 1921, this company called the Converse Rubber Company of Malden, Massachusetts, went to Nat and they offered him, a, they offered him $50 a week if he would go around to various sporting goods stores and sell their new brand of high-topped basketball sneakers. Uh, and Nat said he didn't want to do it because he was already rich, he didn't need the money, and so they gave the job to another popular player of the time, some of you are anticipating what I'm about to say, a guy named Chuck Taylor, um, who was a very good sneaker salesman, so much so that they put his name on the shoes. Uh, the Chuck Taylor All-Star Sneakers might have been the Nat Holman All-Star Sneakers if uh, it had been otherwise. Uh, but Nat was the kind of legendary head coach at City, and he was making $8,500 a year to coach, which is equivalent to about $90,000 a year today. Well, John Calipari at the University of Kentucky makes $7 million a year in salary, plus endorsement money. Mike Krzyzewski makes $7 million a year at Duke. Uh, there are 69 Division I head coaches who make a million dollars a year or more in salary. The NCAA recently signed an $8.8 .8 billion contract uh, with TV for TV rights. So the juxtaposition between the amount of money that's flowing through the game and the players on whose back this all is based getting nothing, not allowed to partake of any of it, you're always going to have uh, uh, a tendency, or, or I should say a fertile ground for bribery in a situation like that. You know, I was talking to one of the players uh, from this team, the City College team, 
uh, I spoke to all of the surviving members of the team. Uh, I was privileged to be able to do so for this book. And one of them, you know, said to me, you know, I'd go to the games at the Garden. You know, City College played all of their home games at Madison Square Garden. Uh, let's see, I think we have a photo of that, by the way. There we go, the old Madison Square Garden. Um, and this guy said to me, you know, I'd go into the games at the Garden and it would be full, there'd be 18,000 people there. And I think every one of those people paid to get in here tonight. And where did that money go? He said, not to me. I was making five bucks a night selling my free tickets, you know, out front of the garden. The players would, you know, stand out in front of the garden and sell their tickets. So he had a kind of entrepreneurial view of the whole, the whole thing. You know, but it is true, not to justify what he did, but it is true that on a college basketball night at the garden, everybody in the arena, other than the fans who had paid to get in, were, were making money off the games. You know, the coaches, the referees, the sports writers, the food vendors, well, the bookmakers, they were all getting paid. Well, that was certainly true of the, the, the 1919 Chicago White Sox, the so-called yeah, Black Sox, because right. of the scandal. I mean, everybody was making money off the, right. uh, the Their owner, Charles Comiskey, uh, was so tight, you know, he could squeeze a penny so that Lincoln's face turned blue. Uh, um, yeah. So they felt they were entitled uh, to get some of uh, the gravy, no? Well, that's true. And, and um, you know, it's really a situation that's sort of unique in American society when you think about it, where you have a group of talented young players who are able to make enormous profits, enormous profits for other people, but not partake of any of it themselves. They're called newspaper reporters. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be, but... Um, uh, but that was the situation that, you know, but, but it's interesting too, you know, a lot of the guys did it um, for, very, for very different reasons, for various reasons. And part of the reason for me writing this book was to try to move past the cliches of the newspaper headlines, not to, not to in any way demean your profession. Okay, I avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the players were, were treated simply as kind of bad guys, you know, as corrupt guys, as immoral guys, guys who are willing to sell out their, their, their schools for a few bucks. And as it turns out, it's actually far more complicated than that. And they had a lot of different motivations for doing what they did. You know, I, I mentioned that this one guy had kind of an entrepreneurial view of the thing, you know, but Eddie Roman, who was the center uh, for, the, for the team, he wanted to give the money to his mother to help pay off the mortgage because he saw his mother fretting at the kitchen table every night. She couldn't pay off the mortgage. Floyd Lane, um, who's still uh, around, a uh, wonderful individual, um, you know, he, he said no on two separate occasions. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to shave points. And he finally agreed to do it because he saw that everybody else on the team was doing it. And he finally agreed to do it. He took $3,000 which he wrapped in a handkerchief and buried in a flower pot in his bedroom so that his mother, Lina, would not find out. And he never touched any of it except for $110 that he used to buy his mother a washing machine for Christmas because she had never had a washing machine before. But he was arrested along with all the others and, and thrown out of college and banned from basketball for life uh, and spent the rest of his life trying to resuscitate his reputation and try to you know, prove to the world that he was not the person that they thought he was. Um, if I could read one passage, I, as I was preparing for this evening, that I, I had not been familiar with, Paul Gallico, uh, very famous sports writer in the 30s, later became a screenwriter, uh, wrote this in the mid-1930s uh, about basketball, which he said, it appeals to the Hebrew with his oriental background because the game places a premium on an alert, scheming mind, and flashy trickiness, artful dodging, and general smart aleckness. Now, not too much stereotyping there, but, um, <laughs> but um, and I'm, I'm actually not gonna even assume an, any anti-Semitic streak necessarily there. It may have just been a, a, a widely held view. Uh, uh, at the time, I'm not defending it, guys, you know, but it's, it's odd. Um, why was basketball to some degree back then a Jewish game to the way you, nobody would even see it now except maybe in Tel Aviv? But, um, um, and 
how did it then become a black game? Well, these days in professional basketball, a black and Croatian game. But uh, um, are blacks uh, displaying that same scheming mind and flashy trickiness? And, and <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The type of the type of uh, game that was played at City College back then was known around town as Jubal. That's what it was called, Jubal. Um, that was because it had come from these settlement houses, you know, that, that Nat Holman had grown up in. Um, and the type of game that was played was the, you know, had been, had been uh, born on the settlement house courts, which were very small. They were smaller than typical, and they had low ceiling, you know, low ceilings. And, you know, it put an emphasis on a lot of motion and movement. And, you know, if you look at films of the, of the, the games back then, they look totally different than, than today's games. And not just because, you know, the shorts are like up to here, you know. Um, and they're taking, you know, free throws under, you know, underhanded and they're shooting set shots and so forth, you know. But there's constant movement. All five members of the team are moving constantly as a way to kind of to see... Uh, the the opponents, um, and that was considered to be a very Jewish style of play, which was already by the 40s kind of becoming passe, and only City was really still using it. Um, and the real innovation that City used, we're kind of getting into the weeds with this, was that they married the motion offense of Nat Holman with the fast break offense that Bobby Sand, who was the assistant coach, uh, another Jewish player, brought to uh, brought to the team. Um, Nat Holman doesn't come across particularly well in your book, actually. I, he seems terribly vain, um, self-absorbed, almost even a little greedy, even without the Vitalis ad. Um, uh, did that come as a surprise to you um, in your research, or did you have a, a, a preconception that this is who he was? And Bobby Sand, the assistant coach, not to be confused with Bobby Sands, the IRA hunger striker, uh, I got a lot of, of your... uh, interesting Google, Google hits, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I bet I you did. Yes. Uh, um, seems to me he kind of took a fall for right. something that was probably not his... Uh, he was fired, if, I, if I'm remembering in the book correctly. Uh, right. um, other than the fact that life is often unfair, um, how did this happen? Well, this was Nat Holman. Uh, Nat Holman, this is an ad for the 62nd... Vitalis hair workout uh, that Nat appeared in. He appeared in a lot of ads. He was really a celebrity. You know, he was in Wheaties ads. He was in Ovaltine ads. Um, he was really, really famous. Um, and the players, I was surprised to discover, really didn't like him. Um, I had no conception of this going in uh, because I had sort of bought into the public myth about him. Right. You know, which was that he was this basketball genius, which in a cert certain way he was. Um, but he was this very vain guy. You know, he had grown up on Eldridge Street, and he spoke with uh, what the players called a British accent, you know. Um, it wasn't a British accent. It was a transatlantic accent. They were not so good at parsing, you know, upper class accents. But, you know, he sounded like Franklin Roosevelt. And his brother, Jack, who he ran a summer camp with, you know, used to say, I don't know where he got this phony accent. I, I grew up in the same place he did, you know. But that was, that was sort of Nat, you know. He, you know, and he dressed beautifully, and, you know, he got his suits at Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, and he didn't know the players' names a lot of the time, as it turns out. You know, Floyd Lane told me, he called me Lloyd for two years. Um, and, you know, Ed Roman was referred to, he called him big, he kept calling him big boy, big boy. Um, and, you know, he cursed at the players a lot. Um, you know, Erwin Dambrod was sort of his favorite player. He was kind of the golden boy. He was the captain of the team. And even he didn't escape his wrath. You know, once during a game, uh, during a, a, a practice, Erwin made a mistake, and, and Nat stopped the, the, the practice, and he said, Dambrod, how tall are you? And Dambrod says, 6'4". And he says, 6'4"? I didn't know they could sh pile shit that high. Well, that, you know, that was Nat. So, uh, you know, there's another story where um, during a game, he got very frustrated uh, with one of the players, and he turned to uh, the player next to him, Norm Major, and he said, Major, get in there and replace that stupid son of a bitch. And Major says, okay, and he takes off his, 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 uh, his uh, 
sweats and he runs around to the scorer's table and then he thinks about it for a moment and he runs back to Nat and says, Nat, which stupid son of a bitch do you mean? Um, but what I found out was that, from the players, was that Bobby Sand was really the, the coach of the team. You know, that, that Nat was very good in, in the gym. He was what, you know, what the players call the practice coach. He was very good at practice. But it, during games, he would kind of lo lose track of things. And Bobby was the one who sat next to him on the bench and would whisper, Nat, I think it's time to call a timeout. Nat, I think you should press now. Nat, I think you should take this guy out. Just loud enough for Nat to hear. Nobody else knew that uh, because Nat was very vain and Bobby was very modest. But it, when the scandal happened, uh, Nat professed to not know anything about what had happened. And ultimately, uh, he escaped any kind of yeah. retribution. And he kept his position as head coach at City College right up to the very end. He retired as head coach of City College and as a member of the National Basketball Hall of Fame. Bobby Sands, his assistant coach, took the fall. He was banned from coaching for 20 years uh, and he was a wonderful economics professor. He was the only basketball, he had played basketball at City College. He was the only Rhodes Scholar ever to be a basketball player at City College. He spoke five languages. He was banned from the classroom for 15 years. It took several lawsuits on his part before he was allowed to teach again. So, you know, this is pretty typical. You know, Nat maintained a position of what Nixon would have called plausible deniability, mm. and he kind of skated through, and the low man on the totem pole took the fall. Speaking of five languages reminds me there was a, a, a catcher uh, in the major leagues named Mo Berg. Um, who was Jewish and one of his teammates once said, yeah, the guy could speak 11 languages and he can't hit in any of them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, clearly these guys could play ball in all of them. Um, can I just ask a bit about your, your research uh, uh, on this? You're obviously going back uh, 70 years. Um, virtually all that team is, is gone now. Uh, we gratefully have Ron Nadell here and it's too bad Floyd Lane uh, couldn't be here this evening. Uh, and I think Ron told me beforehand that there's one other player, Cone, who's Perfect. still alive, Perfect Herb Cone. Cone. Yeah. Um, so how many, I mean, uh, you didn't have a lot of first person uh, uh, interviews available to you, right? So was this mostly uh, a uh, archives uh, look or, or something other than that? No, uh, I mean, it was partly that. And City College has a wonderful archives. Um, so that uh, was fantastic. And there were many, uh, there were I think three student newspapers at City College that did excellent work covering not just the, the championship season but also the subsequent scandal. Very great, you know, Marvin Kalb uh, was a, the sports reporter for the campus newspaper at the time. Um, but I ended up interviewing probably about 135 people for the book. Uh, there were five members of the team at the time who were still with us, and I managed to speak to all of them. Uh, I'm very grateful to Ron, who's here, because he was the first person that I called up. And I had heard that he was living on Long Island, and I called him up, and I explained who I was and what I was doing, and I said, you know, do you mind if I come you know, to your house and interview you? And there was a pause, and I felt my future is hanging in this moment. And finally, Ron said, what the hell? And I don't know if that sounds like you, but that's what you said. <laughs> and, uh, and that was you know, the beginning of it. Um, and you know, thanks to Ron, and uh, you know, I managed to talk to all of the other members of the team. You know, Floyd Lane, I spent a, a lot of time with. Uh, he's really one of the major figures of the book. You know, there was a, a, a funny thing where I was talking to Floyd and you know, we had probably spent about 10 hours together at that point, and, and we were talking about the second championship game against Bradley, and I said, you know, did anything happen before the game that was, that was interesting? And uh, he said, well, I don't, really, I don't really remember that, you know, 65 years earlier. I said, really? Because you know, you're sort of on the precipice of history. You know, it seems like there would be you know, kind of a big thing. He said, well, he said, I think that was the, the time that, that Jackie Robinson came in and spoke to us. And my head kind of shot up because I had not heard anything about this. I said, what? 
He said, yeah, Jackie Robinson came in and spoke to us. I said, what did he say? And he said, well, I don't really remember. I said, Floyd, you better remember, because if you don't remember, I can't put it in the book. So he sort of remembered, but I didn't have confirmation. So I went back to Ron, with whom I had already spoken once, and I went to his house and I said, Ron, you know, Floyd mentioned that there was somebody who uh, spoke to you before the Bradley game. Do you, do you have any memory of that? And Ron said, oh, you mean when Jackie Robinson came and spoke? I said, why didn't you tell me, you know, the first time? But, um, you know, it was like that, you know, that over long periods of time, people, you know, remember things. And, and for the, the, the guys who are no longer with us, I spoke to their widows, I spoke to their children, I spoke to friends, neighbors, and so forth. And, you know, students who were there right. at the time, opponents, sports writers, trying to put together as full a view of the situation as I possibly could. Well, I'd like to bring up two who are there, Mort Scheinman and Ron Nadell, but first, if I may, just as one more sort of broader question, uh, if, if you will. Um, we've long, Lord knows, they've long since been granted absolution, all those players uh, um, back then. Should we be doing the same, and should their sport be doing the same with uh, probably much, much more famous sinners, if you will, of today? Uh, I'm thinking particularly of baseball scandals, the, the uh, Pete Rose, and particularly gambling uh, on games, um, and has been denied entry to the Hall of Fame, where he all certainly belongs on the, on the merits of his achievements. Um, or the steroid abusers, uh, Barry Bonds, uh, no, most notoriously, or Alex Rodriguez, Roger Clemens. Uh, is absolution theirs at some point? Um, if not, so I, I think actually Clemens and Bonds didn't do too badly in the rec most recent Hall of Fame right. bat balloting. They didn't make it, um, but it sort of suggests that maybe next year, maybe the year after is not uh, too far-fetched. Uh, this is something that I thought about a lot uh, over the course of writing this book. Um, I think that there's a real difference between what the players at City College were doing versus what the individual guys were doing um, in baseball. And there's certainly a difference between what happened to the players who were 18 years old, 19 years old, and uh, took money in you know, a handful of games and were banned for life. Uh, were not permitted to make a living um, in their in what would have been their profession uh, versus somebody like Pete Rose who is being denied the ultimate accolade uh, of being of being granted entrance to the Hall of Fame. So that certainly is different. What's also different in the case of Pete Rose versus the case, for instance, of Floyd Lane is that Floyd admitted what he had done and uh, owned up to it explained why he had done it, and tried to atone uh, himself, and spent the rest of his life actually behaving in an incredibly honorable way, uh, devoted himself to the children of New York City, uh, versus Rose, who lied about it for years and years and years, denied, 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 lied, dissembled, and so forth. Sounds and familiar. I, and I think that, <laughs> uh, I don't know what you mean, but. Um, I have no idea either. Uh, so I think, I think that that you know, has a bearing on the situation as well. Fair enough. Um, Ron, would you join us? Mort, please. <laughs> I do have questions for these guys, but Ron uh, asked if um, he could read something that he wrote, and uh, I'm going to say no. I figured after 91 years, I got to write things down. <laughs> uh, first, let me say, uh, regard to Matthew and these four guys that were picked up after the Temple game and uh, after playing Temple in Pennsylvania. I, unfortunately, was one of the four guys. But thank God, they picked up seven of them in the long run, and I was number eight on the team. So thank God I wasn't that good to be one of the seven. 
also number two, outside of Madison Square Garden. Where did they get the five dollars for those tickets? I never, <laughs> I never heard about I that. Asked, I have to ask Herbie Cohen that. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, uh, I'm honored and privileged to be invited here at the Center for Jewish History. I would like to briefly talk about two subjects. One, the scandals, and two, the double championships, the NIT and the NCAA. If you took a scale at the halls of justice and weighed both of them, I can guarantee you the scales would tip towards the championships. Why? Because people tend, over time, to forgive and forget and that being said, in 1994, 25 years after City College won both the NIT and the NCAA, in the same year, one week apart, the sports writers and coaches voted City College into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. That's probably the highest honor a player, a coach, or a team can receive, and that honor will be cherished forever. Excuse me, I'm a little slow. Also in 2009, the City College basketball team was voted number one as the greatest moment in the Madison Square Garden 75 year history. It was a shock and an honor. Another great honor and moment that I cherished. So for you people, forgive, forget, and respect achievements that is known. With regard to the scandal, all those involved in the City College became model citizens. I'm sure, Matt, you wrote that in the book and you'll read about that. One became a dentist, who happened to have been my dentist in Forest Hills. But he was a better basketball player than a dentist. <laughs> No, he was really good. That was Erwin Dambrot. Also, they became social workers, and one in particular, Floyd, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, became a very successful high school basketball coach and a mentor for some NBA players. NBA players, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. Well, who was it? Well, he was the, the mentor for Nate Tiny Archibald, who became a Hall of Fame yes. uh, player. Yes, yeah. Well, I guarantee you all, that when you read Matthew Goodman's book, The City Game, you will not put it down. It's an incredible book. There were things in that book which astounded me. I didn't even know what was going on. You'll read about the scandals, not only in colleges, but also in the pros and the coaches. Also the police and judges. Everybody was in taking money. Of course, you'll read about the players and the lives of the city college City College basketball team. So again, I would like to thank Judy and the Jewish Center for History for inviting me to this auspicious occasion. Thank you. Um, well, could I ask you, uh, Ron, did you have a sense then that something was going on at all? Or did other players who were not involved with the gamblers have some sense that there was something underway? I, I guess I did, but I never told Matthew that. There were times when I was in the game, and I did play some, that I cut for the basket, nobody guarding me, and I never got the ball. Mm -hmm. 
I couldn't understand why. But I guess after a while, I understood the reason. Hmm. And Mort, uh, you were a student then. You would have been a freshman during the... the I was a the freshman team. when uh, when the team won the double championship and a sophomore when the roof fell in. I, I want to say and, a, a, a couple of words about sorry. Floyd Lane uh, that haven't been said yet. Um, <coughs> to me, Floyd Lane was the ultimate story of redemption. He was probably the most popular player on the team as far as the students were concerned. He was a gentleman, he is a gentleman, um, and, and when the initial arrests were made, Floyd was not among them. And the general feeling on campus was they couldn't touch Floyd. Floyd was not going to succumb to the lure of the quick buck. And a few days later, after a tremendous rally in the Great Hall at City College, where the student body turned out to rally around what was left of the team, and to rally around Matt Holman, the icon, The final game of the season was going to be played a couple of days later. Uh, and it was the last time City College ever played at Madison Square Garden. And it was against Lafayette, which I think was the team that opened the season for them. Uh, I'm not sure. Floyd was the hero in that game. And, and he did something uh, so outlandish. Uh, just just before halftime, uh, with the clock ready to uh, sound the end of halftime, Floyd would, uh, had the ball and he was somewhere around midcourt and he threw it uh, toward the basket, a shot he would never take uh, during, during another point of the game. But this was the last second, literally, shot from about 50 feet out and it went in. It was a night when anything seemed possible. City College won that game. Uh, there were more student tickets sold for that game than for any game the year before for the postseason, for either tournament. Floyd was literally carried off the court on the shoulders of exactly, the fans. Exactly, and that didn't happen at City College games. A few days later, Floyd was arrested. He was pulled out of class and arrested. And that was like a hammer blow to the mood on campus. Time passed. Floyd took his punishment. And then he was hired by City College to coach the basketball team. And he took it to a metropolitan championship. It wasn't a national championship. But I thought it was more spectacular than that. This was a guy who really, he, he, he was everybody's hero. He fell from grace. He had another shot because he kept working with kids from the time he, he was in college until, yeah. until he was uh, years out of college. That's what he did. He tried to make up for it. I think he would have done that anyway, working with kids. That's what he loved. Um, but to have him redeem himself like that was quite spectacular. I just wanted to right. mention no, I'm, I'm glad you did. Thank you. I mentioned um, in the book that 23 years earlier, he had been escorted off of the campus by two detectives. That's right. And now he was returning to the campus as the head coach um, of City College. You know, I spoke to him, uh, and again, this was about 65 years later, and he didn't want to talk about the scandal, but eventually we did talk about the scandal. And finally, he was able to say to me, you know, I spent so many, so many years trying to get into the NBA. That was really my goal. And I thought just five minutes on the court could change the whole course of my life. And I never was granted those five minutes um, on the court. He said, but ultimately, I think it was for the best. Because if I were in the NBA, he said, I would have been untouchable. And it, 
and instead, I got to touch the lives of thousands of kids um, in New York. So from, you know, from my perspective, for him, the scandal had been a tragedy, a personal tragedy. But for the children of New York City, it was a kind of blessing because it allowed them to know Floyd Lane. Were there players in the NBA in that era who indeed had done similar things in college? Well, Normie Major, who was at City, right. um, had, he was a senior, and he, he did play in the NBA for a year, and then he got arrested mm -hmm. and right. for Baltimore, and he, and, he, um, and he never played again. Can I ask um, you, Ron, and Mort, um, to give your different perspectives of what it was like on campus um, once the scandal broke? You know, were you shunned by fellow students? Were you or looked at suspic uh, suspiciously? By some, was that your sense of it? Did, did, it couldn't have just been life as before, I assume. So uh, what was it like uh, to be, what were you, 19, 20 maybe, uh, uh, to be a young man suddenly swept up in this storm? Well, I think the campus at that time was pretty sad. They were kind of astonished. However, I still think that all these students were still for us, the players, and the players that were involved. Uh, they didn't shun them. They didn't want to shun them. They were still proud of them. And they were proud of what we accomplished the year before. And that's your turn. Yeah. Um, I think. In talking among ourselves, the inevitable question was raised, what would you do in that situation? You mean being offered, I mean, remember, some of the players will receive $1,500 or even 2000 Well, that was a lot of money in 1950 or 51. Uh, $1,500 was equivalent to something like seventeen or 18000 uh, in today's dollars. I'd be tempted. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I think Matthew uh, hit on it that the reason why Floyd did it was hey everybody else is doing it so why not me exactly that was that was our rationalization and that was the right. students who were witnessing yeah. so my, what was going on yeah. everybody else is doing it you can't blame these guys you know no more evil than other people my kids ask me they're here now. What would I have done? I said, naturally, I never would have taken a nickel. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> I might have taken a nickel. Um, but only a nickel. A nickel. Well, a nickel in those days was, <laughs> was worth five dollars, which we got outside the garden. Who was that? the tickets. Franklin Adams, I think it was, who said, what this country needs is a good five-cent nickel. Uh, <laughs> The, um, we've talked a bit, and, and it, it is a part of the book, uh, about the uh, black and Jewish nature of the team, um, more so, frankly, than the school as a whole. Um, it was largely Jewish. Um, um, did that extend to the neighborhood that City College was in? I, was, uh, I showed up in 1962, and worked on the student newspaper, uh, and we often, after we got kicked out of uh, the Finley Student Center at about 11 o'clock, finished editing uh, articles uh, in a nearby bar, uh, the highlight, uh, and I, but I, we never really, who we were kidding, we never really interacted with the neighborhood. I, we've, I felt we were like an island in, in, inside a, a larger uh, sphere, was that? True, so this black Jewish, you know, kumbaya uh, is lovely, but is it real? Was it real? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, we, we, we did the late editing uh, in a Chinese restaurant. Oh, you were better than we, we were just a cheap bar. <laughs> and, and, and the neighborhood was a place you walked through from the subway. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, there was never any sense of danger uh, up on St. Nicholas Heights, although sometimes thing hap things happened, 
as they would anywhere else in New York City, um, and continue to. Um, I, I wanted to make another point, too, about things that continue. Uh, Matthew uh, mentioned the fact that everybody in Madison Square Garden was making money except the athletes, the reason that people came to the garden. Um, there's a story in this morning's New York Times about whether college athletes should be paid uh, for, for, for their talents. Um, so the discussion continues. Uh, uh, did you, Rowan, continue friendships with your um, teammates afterwards? Was, was this a band of brothers, if you will, that, that continued for quite a while or? Not the only really. friends that I continued with are the friends that I grew up with in Brooklyn. Mm. There's Al Roth. Uh, the other guys on the team were all from New York City. And as Matthew said, we played basketball, we practiced, and we went home. We didn't hang around 100 and, was it, 95th Street or 160? I forgot. 35th. 135th Street. We didn't hang around that area. We just finished our practice and went home to our family and our friends in Brooklyn. Should we take questions? I think so, yeah. I would like to throw this uh, open to you folks. Anybody have questions, observations? Can I? Plead, plead with you to really make them questions. I, I can be kind of ruthless in cutting long speeches off, so please let's uh, do it. And I'll, I'll repeat for the benefit of somebody who's recording this, I'll repeat the question uh, from up here. Hi, um, my name is Myron Roshetsky. Yes, it is. So, <laughs> and I was the sports editor of the campus and when Floyd was brought back as coach. Um, in the book, Matthew, you point out that Ed Roman said that on that Sunday morning at Penn Station when he was arrested, that was the last time he ever talked to Nat Holman. Mm -hmm. Was that typical of the relationship of the players? And in relation, and regard to that, also in the book, you point out how a few days before the press conference, when Floyd was named a coach at City College, of which, as I remarked at the, uh, the, the book launch, how, as a sports editor then, I wrote the story about the press conference. I think my lead was something about how there was more people at the press conference than at recent games, uh, that we had a, a picture with a deep caption on page one of the campus, tracing back to my story on the back page. And I was pissed off that we, I thought we had underplayed the significance of Floyd coming back as coach. After reading your book, I'm even more pissed off. So when Floyd called Nat to speak at the press conference, had they been in communication? Had they been in contact, unlike Ed Roman? Uh, not, not really. Um, Floyd Lane, you know, we've, we've spoken about him a fair amount tonight. Floyd Lane is a, is a man of really singular honor uh, and, and decency and dignity. And um, when Floyd was, uh, I was going to say given the job, when he earned the job uh, of head coach at City College, he did this remarkable thing, which was to invite uh, the 78-year-old Nat Holman to attend the press conference that announced his hiring. Um, it was a way for Floyd to sort of put old demons to rest in a way, to acknowledge, acknowledge the past and try to move beyond the past, to put aside, uh, put aside the bad memories um, of the past. It was really a moment of remarkable reconciliation between the present and the past. Uh, so it was really quite a remarkable thing that Floyd did. Uh, Nat did not keep in touch with the players after the scandal. Eddie Roman did say that, you know, on the platform, on the, on the train platform, 
Nat turned to the players and said, uh, go with these men, the detectives, go with these men, tell them what you know. If you're innocent, then all will be well, and if it, you're not, then have mercy on you. And he turned and he walked off down the platform. And he, he said to Ed, call me when you get back. And he turned and he walked off down the platform. And Eddie Roman thought later that those were the last words that Nat Holman ever spoke to him. Uh, Nat did not arrange for attorneys for the players, did not contact the president of the college to tell him what had happened. Um, uh, unlike St. John's, by the way, where their player came in accompanied by an attorney, um, unlike the City College players. So uh, Nat also, by the way, did not contact the parents of the players. He turned to Bobby Sand and said, this is your job. You're going to call the players' parents. And, uh, and, and Bobby did that. And they wept together that night on the phone. He said, the ax has fallen. Um, and, uh, and that was that. Matthew, I'll say that uh, that's 100% correct. I was on that platform, and that's exactly what Nat said. And other words that he said was, if you guys are innocent, I'll stand behind you 100%. But if you're guilty, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. So you're 100% correct. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about something in the book, the Kentucky game. Um, what, are your, what are your memories about that? I have no personal memories of that game, um, but I will say that uh, it was a, it's it's one of the high points of the book. And then I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did the Kentucky the, the Kentucky the game against memories. Kentucky memories of the Kentucky game. Well, that was probably the greatest moment in the history of the City College playing Kentucky. When we first came out on the court, they wouldn't even look at us, talk to us and shake our hands when the game started. But the interesting part, and I told Matthew, that some of the Kentucky players that we were playing against, Spivey and a couple of others, were with us at the Hotel Brickman that summer, and we played with him. He was our teammate. That was the greatest victory, a 47-point victory, I think, that City College ever had. It was an amazing thing because Kentucky was led by uh, Adolf Rupp. Uh, Kentucky had not had a black player. They would not have a black player for another 20 years, uh, long after other teams in the SEC had integrated, Kentucky did not. Uh, there were no black students at the University of Kentucky. The graduate program had only been uh, had only been integrated that summer by force of court order, a case brought by a young attorney by the name of Thurgood Marshall. Um, but there was a lot of resistance to that, and so the campus had been the site that summer of seven cross burnings uh, on the campus of the University of Kentucky. Adolph Rupp made no secret of his feelings about this. He, uh, I found a, uh, an interview that he gave a few years earlier to New York sports writers where he said, or as I say in the book, he theologized, the Lord never meant for a white boy to play a colored boy, else he wouldn't have painted them different colors. Uh, and now they were coming to New York to play a team that was composed entirely of black and Jewish players, where the two captains, Erwin Dambrod and Joe Gallagher, were a black and a Jew. Joe Gallagher was a member of the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and as Ron mentioned, when the game, just before the game began, the City College players put out their hands to shake hands, and the Wildcats turned away. They refused to shake hands with the City College players. And I spoke, I don't know if you were there that night, Mort, but I spoke to many people who were there that night, and they all used the same adjective to describe it. It was electric. It was electric at that moment. And City won 89 to 50, uh, the worst defeat in the history of Adolph Rupp's career at the University of Kentucky. And just to just to say that when I spoke to Ron about this, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but the next day, Nat took the players to the Majestic Theater to see South Pacific, which was the big show on Broadway that, at that time, and to celebrate. And before the show, uh, you were all sitting in the orchestra, before the show, the PA announcer announced that the City College team was there. 
in the audience, and the crowd all stood and gave a standing ovation to the team because you had beaten Kentucky. And Ron said to me, I felt at that moment that we all could have run for president. <laughs> not elected. Not, not, not to mention, we'll take a question here, but not to mention that South Pacific has one of the earliest songs about on? racial it's harmony. Uh, to taught, yeah. You've got to be taught. Yes, sir. Mr. Goodman, may I make a uh, observation about a subject that was addressed in the book, but perhaps see it in application in a different sports arena? I'm a former district attorney in Kings County. I'm also a former United States national soccer team player and a high school basketball player. I believe that there is a commonality in the corruption of ethics in sports. That corruption of, of that commonality of corruption revealed itself in your book when you talk about the fact that people who are subject to a violation of ethics are beautiful and clean, if I quote you correctly. I am referring to the recent United States World Cup women's soccer team and their conduct. Their lack of sportsmanship and humility and failure to honor the integrity of the sport as well as their lack of respect for their opponents. The City College players, who I believe, were victims of their personal backgrounds and also victims of their glamorized station. Sir, can we uh, make this a question pretty quickly? As I, I, I will, I will, sir. I mean, very quickly. <laughs> I struggle to recognize and reconcile the differences in the two groups, but I conclude that the city players receive my compassion and understanding and forgiveness while the other group does not. Uh, um, I don't know if there was a question there, quite honestly, um, except the women's soccer team didn't come off very well up there. Um, we'll let it go. Can you give it a break? Oh, we have. Okay, I, uh, here I, and then I'll go to Ray Corio, who was uh, my sports editor once upon a time. I only have a question, not a statement. Thanks. Nor was I a district attorney. <laughs> a, a question to Matt. I thought I saw you sort of blanch when Ron said, when he was asked whether he had any sense that there was something going on, and he mentioned about not getting a pass when he was wide open, but it, that he never mentioned it to you. And I just wonder what happened. He was saving it for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Why, here and in there. I think Ron did mention that to me, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a lot of question um, at the time about, or certainly later, about whether or not people should have known that this was going on. And, you know, Nat Holman always insisted that he never knew what was going on. Uh, people said, well, you know, you're literally, you literally call yourself Mr. Basketball. You know, he tried to get that name trademarked, actually. Uh, how could you, you've been spending your whole life watching basketball, how could you not have known? But, you know, the kinds of things that went on, the kinds of things that went on to, to uh, go under a point spread were very subtle things. You know, to miss a shot on purpose. These players were missing 70% of their shots anyway. You know, a 30% shooting percentage in those days was pretty good. You know, throwing a pass just a, a split second too late or too early, you know, fumbling a rebound uh, and so forth. These were all the sorts of things that happened normally in the course of of, of a game, um, and uh, a lot of people uh, suspected that point shaving was going on, but didn't necessarily know that from watching, um, from watching the games. But of course, you were there, uh, there, so you might have had a kind of inner knowledge of, of it. Yeah, well, my, my feeling is that I, I think Nat had to know. I mean, the man was not stupid. To see guys like Roman, who was a great shooter, and was throwing balls over the basket, and with Warner, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that his ego got in his way, and he's saying to himself, how can these boys 
do that to me. Mm -hmm. It can't be true. He also said, by the way, that he never believed that a city college man would ever do that. I, I asked Bobby Sand after the arrests were made. I said, Bobby, how could Nat not know? And he said, I'll tell you how. He said, to Nat Holman, basketball was a religion. And he could not believe that somebody is going to pervert his religion. Bobby defended Nat in spite of the, the back of the hand treatment that Bobby got from Nat for years. He defended him right down to the end. Well, I, I think I never told you this, Matthew. It's amazing, there's all this stuff that I'm learning <laughs> tonight. Maybe you'll write another <laughs> yeah, it's book. A sequel, yeah. A sequel, yeah. right? That's the, paper, the paperback edition, we'll have all this stuff. Anyhow, when we were on the train, I had this conversation. Bobby was talk Bobby Sand was talking to us and he knew what was going on. He said these guys are throwing games. And he knew it deep down in his heart. But he never came out with it. This is when a newspaper man says, Sweetheart, get me rewrite. We want to change this. <laughs> we'll take from this gentleman and then Ray Corio over here if we My name is Barry Garfinkel. I don't have a question, but I have some information and observation for everybody. I worked as a waiter for four years at a place called Scarron Manor on Screw Lake. And a good part of the city college team was off there. Ronnie Dell was there, Erwin Dambrot, Eddie Roman. Eddie Roman was my bus boy. Uh, Fratz Roth was there. And I got to tell you, these guys, during the, we'd work a morning shift an afternoon shift, and they were out in the basketball team, uh, the basketball court, all afternoon practicing. I mean, they were working, working hard in the dining room and working hard at the, at the sport. And looking back, after the scandal broke, I was there in class of 49, 50, and then went on to law school. Looking back, there were pockets of gamblers that used to come up as guests. And I think the contacts with those guys, Ron, were made in a place like Scarab Manor. Um, thank you, thank you, Barry. Um, if the microphone can go here, uh, break. Bre what, what, you have to use the mic. I, th I think my questions were oh, right. oh, okay. pretty much covered, but I just wanted to know Matthew's takeaway of, of Nat's legacy, because I think what, um, what Clyde was referring to when he came back from the service, those great Nick teams were coached by Red Holzman, who was a disciple of Nat Holman. And uh, so there's a lot of people who Nat Holman was, you know, a teacher yeah. and a, and a worthy of being in the Hall of Fame. What did you come away from? All, all of the players said to me that Nat was a genius in the gym. I mean, he was, a, he, was, he was an amazing basketball player, and he was very good. He was able to see all 10 players at once, and uh, they were kind of amazed that he was able to do that. And, and little by little, during practices, the players found themselves getting better uh, under the watchful guidance of Nat Holman. Uh, he was a very good practice coach. Um, and you're right, you know, one of his star pupils in the 40s before this team was uh, Red Holtzman, who went on to be the coach of the greatest, this is a very low bar, the greatest <laughs> Knicks teams. Uh, oh, come on, 70, come on, they were 70, wonderful teams. So, no, they were fantastic teams. Teams. No, 70, 73. Uh, no, they were, they were great even with a very high bar, but... But then one of the players who learned under Red Holtzman was Bill Jackson. Um, so you see another, another generation that sort of gets passed down from Nat Holman, Red Holtzman, Bill Jackson. Um, so his legacy on the basketball court, I think, uh, is very strong. Um, and his players really appreciated that. Uh, his legacy as a man, his legacy as an individual, um, is, a different, is a different story. Are there any questions uh, further? Here we go. Yes, sir. You have the microphone. 
proud graduate of 1970 with a bachelor's and master's at City College in 73. Um, I had the privilege of actually having professional and family uh, relationships with two of the players, uh, Erwin Dambrot and uh, Leroy Watkins. Educationally, I worked in Leroy Watkins School. He was a principal. He was a very upstanding, special kind of man. Um, I was a simple district reading person, and he treated me like I was a king when I came to his school. So I have to say that he was a tremendous person, and yep. to stand up to the discrimination that he stood up to was just amazing. Erwin Dambrot was um, one of the, the best moral, decent human beings that I've ever met. My family grew up with him as our dentist. He was a cousin through marriage. Uh, just a question. I understand there were outside pressures on these gentlemen in terms of family uh, to, to take these bribes or else. And I have not had the pleasure. I just got the book yesterday. I understand if I got it two days ago, I would have been able to finish it by tonight. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to reading it. Uh, were there outside pressures that we're not talking about? Leroy Watkins, who was an amazing individual, a wonderful man, who's no longer with us, but I spoke to his son, Leroy Watkins Jr., uh, who's an attorney in, in uh, Westchester. Uh, he, never he never took any money. He was not involved in this at all. Uh, Irwin was. Irwin took money, though. Irwin took money from one, only one game, and then he decided he was out. He said later that he did it because he wanted the other guys to like him. Uh, he was the captain of the team. But uh, he was, Jerry Eisenberg, the great sports writer, said to me, he was kind of a Pagliacci figure, you know, kind of a sad, sad clown. Um, that he, he, Jerry said to me, he, he was, he always, his great dream was to be a corner guy, to hang out on the corner, but he had nobody to hang out on the corner with. Uh, and that's why he did it. He said later, I wanted the guys to like me. Um, and then he felt horrible about having done this, and he, Stop doing it after, afterwards. So he only took it for this one game. One thing that's interesting about Irwin, by the way, he was a wonderful basketball player. He was a senior during the championship season. Um, and he was drafted by the Knicks in the first round. Uh, and I believe, I don't think I'm wrong about this, he's the only player in the history of the NBA, a first round draft pick to say no to go to dental school. Uh, he went to Columbia Dental School rather than play for the Knicks. Well, I think he probably did better as a dentist than he would have done in those years uh, with medical, medical school. Sir, you've got the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for the book. It was a wonderful memory for me. Thank you. I attended Taft High School with Ed Wilson. <laughs> I want to reflect on something. Taft High School was next to Pete's. Pool Hall. Yeah. Pete's Pool Hall, 170th Street, yeah. and Hess's Pool Hall, 167th Street. It was a hangout for bookies yeah. and hangout for players on Taft High School. And there they learned the value of betting. Yeah. I think that's where it all started. The gentleman talked about the summer up at the camps, the league up yeah. in the camp, one hotel play in the other hotel. Yes, gamblers were there, but their introduction to gambling came from these pool halls, which yeah. were gathering sites for young people and all bookies in the neighborhood. So you yeah. subscribe to the song from the Music Man about trouble with yes, capital yes, T yes, that yes. rhymes also, with P that stands for pool, huh? Yeah. Or T that stands for tap. <laughs> or T for tap. Lot of money. And you have to be worried about the pool hall sharks down there also. Who would play right. to lose four or five games, and they would they say, let's play for double the money. And that was the yeah. end. Well, I'm proud to say that Pete's Pool Hall does make an appearance in my book uh, on 170th, 170th Street. Uh, and maybe we'll end with this, with this idea. Um, you know, what I was trying to do with the book is not to justify, is not to justify what the players did, 
not to say that they did the right thing or to say that they, they did the wrong thing, but to, but to in a way, uh, ask the reader, in a sense, to interrogate him or herself, to say, what would I have done, like you were saying? What would I have done if I were in that situation? You know, the newspapers treated them as cliches. And what I was trying to do with the book was to get past the cliches and to say to the reader, what would you have done if you were a poor kid and somebody came along and offered you $2,000, which is more money than you'd ever seen? And, you know, as I mentioned, you're, you know, you're watching your parents fret every, every night at the dinner table because they can't pay the mortgage. And you know that everybody else on your team is doing it. And you know that the guys you're playing against are doing it. And you know that this has been going on for years because you grew up playing in the schoolyard and the older guys told you that they were doing it and how much money they were making and no, they never got caught. And by the way, there are bookmakers and gamblers hanging out at the pool hall where, where you hang out in the afternoons and the evenings. And you know that the cop on the, on the corner is taking money from bookmakers. And you know that the politicians, including the mayor, by the way, O'Dwyer, and the police commissioner, O'Brien, are taking money from bookmakers. And you know, by the way, and this came out later, but you know that City College has altered your tr transcripts to get you in to play basketball because you didn't have the grades to get in. Not all of them, but some of them. Ed Warner. Uh, among others, not just, not just Ed Warner. Um, what would you have done if you were in that situation? And by the way, you're not being asked to lose a game. You're only being asked to change the score of the game and you figure, well, a week from now, nobody's gonna remember what the score of that game was anyway. So what would you have done if you were in that situation? And I'm not saying you should have done it or you would have done it, I'm just simply, asking you to interrogate yourself a little bit and to, and to uh, in a way, kind of broaden your perspective about what was really going on, to try to get past the stereotypes that have long existed about these men. When did Nat Holzman um, start to coach for City College? Because my dad played for City College in the 30s, and Nat Holzman was his coach, and they did not get along. Yeah, Nat, Nat had been at City College since uh, the 20s. Okay, um, because my, he was yeah. my dad's coach. He was a part-time coach in the beginning because he was still playing basketball part-time um, in, those, in those years. I think we have to uh, draw the proceedings to a close. I'll just end it with a quotation. Thank you. I think one thing we've established was that Robert Penn Warren knew what he was saying and all the King's men when he said that man is conceived in sin and born in corruption. Well, we saw a little bit of it, uh, uh, but there's also redemption. And, uh, and that's part of this CCNY story too. Uh, and actually true of the school itself. Uh, there is a kiddish uh, in the back. Uh, um, please partake and um, thank you all for coming.